Acts chapter 5, verse 4, 5, 4, Acts 5, 4. Whiles it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not thine own power, in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you again uh, for your goodness to us, your grace, Lord. Lord, thank you for healing those that we love and caring for our infirmities. Lord, and rightfully we are concerned about those matters, the ones we love and see them suffer. But Lord, often we're not concerned about our own sin and our own hypocrisy in our own lives. Lord, help us to be mindful of that today our need of being transparent to one another and to you. And Lord, I pray that you just work in our hearts. Lord, each of us is uh, sometimes a hypocrite. And Lord, I pray that that would be uh, less and less as we draw close to you in fear of you. And Lord, we just ask for you to work now. For it's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. During one of his political campaigns... A delegation called on Theodore Roosevelt at his home in Oyster Bay, Long Island. The president met them with his coat off and his sleeves rolled up. Ah, gentlemen, he said, come, come down to the barn and we will talk while I do some work. At the barn, Roosevelt picked up a pitchfork, looked around for the hay. Then he called out, John, where's all the hay? Sorry, sir, John called down from the hayloft. I ain't had time to toss it back down again after you pitched it up here while those Iowa folks were here. (laughs) Hypocrisy. We all at times try to present a picture of ourselves that is slightly short of reality. But did you ever consider how deadly hypocrisy can be and is. The word duplicity means the belying of one's true intentions by deception, by deceptive words or actions. Today's story in scripture concerning the fatal actions of Ananias and Sapphira marks the first time the New Testament church experiences trouble from within. To date, any persecution has been found from without. At the onset of Acts chapter 5, we see the ideal church encounter some real problems. The problem was hypocrisy. There were false faces arisen in the membership. You know, nobody likes a hypocrite. Nobody. Nobody including God. So today we're going to investigate why hypocrisy is so deadly for your life and the life of a church. But before we do, let's look at some background and some questions related to the account in the scripture. Number one, the story is a contrast. Catch that first word, but. But. But a certain man named Ananias. It would be better, uh, but Ananias, with his wife, Sapphira, his wife, sold the possession, okay? It would be better translated, also sold a piece of property. Do you catch the contrast there? The contrast is between Ananias and Sapphira, and in the church, remember, we just read that, or studied that last time when we were in Acts, how they were giving in property. They would sell their properties and they would give that for the benefit of others. In particular, there was one, right? Barnabas. And I think that's the real comparison here. The comparison between Barnabas, the encourager, the godly man who gave all his property versus Ananias and Sapphira. I believe it's better is the transparency of the life of Barnabas versus the hidden life 
of Ananias and Sapphira. So I do see this as a, uh, a, a comparison between the transparency of Barnabas and the hypocrisy of this husband and wife. Who are they? Who are Ananias and Sapphira? This is the only place they're mentioned. They have a very short time <laughs> on the scene. Um, they're a husband and wife team. They're not mentioned any elsewhere in Scripture. They come and go rather quickly in the narrative. Ananias' name means God is gracious, which sounds a bit ironic given his fate, right? God is gracious. We must presume that they were indeed true believers, seeing they were part of the church and their actions were regarded against it. In the narrative, we see equal treatment given for the two. That's really neat. I, we don't see this too often. Usually there's one who's the ringleader, but in this case, both are given equal treatment. Ananias about the same amount of verses <laughs> and Sapphira about the same amount of verses. Uh, they both had the same, hatched the same plan and both hatched the same fate in life. Um, they are both equally guilty and both received the same judgment for their sin. They both plotted. They both were responsible for their actions. They both came before Peter who confronts them about the purchase of the land. They both fall down dead before the feet of Peter. They both are carried out. They both are quickly buried by the same young men who serve as witnesses to this confrontation. They were joined in the conspiracy with the funds and they were joined in their death. Why was it sin? Why was it sin? I believe the sin is twofold here. Okay? What I read to you is certainly one of them, the lying. Okay? But there's another one here, and it is embezzlement. Embezzlement. And you're probably embezzlement. What? It was their own property. Was it? The sin was committed against the community of believers. They were a community. A community of the Holy Spirit. And in the community, each of them had their place, had placed their trust in one another. We don't awful often think of churches that, that way, do we? Shame on us, right? You and I are gathered together in, in, in Christ here as believers in this little church in Warrior's Mark, and there is a trust among us, a sacred trust. That's why the pastor and the other people are so dogmatic that you need to be here, you need to fellowship, you need to grow, you need to serve, you need... Why are we that way? Because this is a trust. We're going to go later on in the book of Acts because churches become country clubs, don't they? There's a difference between a country club and a trust. <laughs> okay? And it, you know, when I worked at Lockheed, they trusted me, and I trusted them. I have over 700 shares of stocks to prove my trust in them. And they trusted me with what I did. But this is a lot deeper than you and your corporation or company you work with, isn't it? Because this is a sacred trust between you and God. So this is important stuff. Hey, they are a community <laughs> of trust. But this was not, um, it, not just a place to trust. They found 
they found their identity and their security with one another, didn't they? This first church is very unlike. I mean, this is, I, I believe this is the model. I believe this is how churches should be. Not that we should be giving and selling of our possessions, but there may come a time during times of war or times of famine or whatever in this nation where it may come to that. Okay? Barnabas owned property. It was his rightfully, right? God had provided that for him. Ananias and Sapphira had property too. That was rightfully their own. Okay? That's, that's not a debatable issue here. Okay? But the part with the problem with Ananias and his wife Sapphira is that their hearts are divided. Okay? Like Achan, his sin and his desire for material possessions was against the community, not just a personal sin against God. It was much bigger than that. Let me explain the word kept back there. And kept back of the price. That's the key word here. This is why I can go this far, all right? That word kept back is uh, the Greek, nos fes omaya, okay? It means to purloin, to embezzle to withdraw covertly and appropriate for oneself. Once it had been pledged for the community, it was no longer theirs. Do you understand that? They made a pledge. This is ours. This amount. Whether that was 10%, whether that was... 50% or whether it was 100%, whatever the amount was, it was no longer theirs. It was God's. It was the community's. You understand that? And it rightly belonged to the common Christian fund for the church at Jerusalem. Peter, in verse 5, 4, reminded Ananias that he was under no compulsion to sell his land. And even when he sold it, he and his wife, uh, they could choose to do with it as, as they please. Okay? They could have kept all the proceeds or they could have given a tenth, as I said, or vol voluntarily to community. But once it was pledged to the community, then it became a completely different matter. So they embezzled. No more different than uh, the treasurer stiffening off the top, right? Of giving money. No more like purloining, like us stealing time <laughs> at work or stealing pencils, okay? Or pens or whatever. We think that's petty, it's little stuff, but it's still purloining and it's still embezzlement. It's not ours, it's someone else's. Secondly, they lied to the Holy Spirit. You catch that? The Holy Spirit, therefore, is what? God. You catch that? 3 8. But they said unto it, Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Spirit. In verse 3a, down and down in 4b, thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. Catch that? Catch the theology there? The Holy Spirit is who? God. Somehow, even though the plot was kept between the two, Peter knows they are lying. That's interesting. How did he know that? Was it written on their faces? I think better, the Spirit revealed it to Peter, revealed to them that they were, in fact, lying to him when they came forth. Peter knew that he had given only a part of what he had pledged, and he held back some of it for himself. He attempted to deceive the church, to prop himself up to be the great giver. The couple has allowed Satan the arch enemy. The arch enemy of God. 
God the Spirit to enter into his heart. I mean, we could run with that one. The sin started in his heart. And he allowed Satan to fill his heart. Satan filled his heart and the heart of this couple like he did Judas. In Luke 22, verse 3, same words used there. Remember, filling is not possession. Rather, it is controlling. Ananias yielded to the temptation of pride and covetousness, and in doing so, he gave over control of his heart to Satan, and thusly Satan controlled him. He did not take up residence in him, okay? He just took up control within Ananias. In Sapphira's hearts. Peter's questioning of Sapphira left a door open for her to repent, a door she chose not to enter. The last question Doesn't the actions of God seem drastic here? Right? Don't all Christians? lie don't we all at times prop ourselves up to be something we are not so as not to look so bad in the eyes of other believers why is it so drastic here and that's a good question right i hope you saw it i hope you you i hope you the first thing when you read this passage the first time i read it was whoa <laughs> why god why would you do that so let's address that. This story just seems so out of place, so out of keeping with the gospel. It appears so harsh and so non-redemptive with respect to the other stories in the book of Acts. I mean, it's like we're reading along and everything's like, hey, man, God's working in church. He's working in church. Boom. boom. Acts chapter 5, 1 through 11. Then we get back in the Acts and it's like, boom, 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 boom. You know? It's all understandable. It's all good. It's all growth. It's... Why this? There's no time for deliberation. There's no time for repentance or forgiveness sought. Someone has said that if God dealt with all hypocrites in the church as he dealt with this couple, our churches would become morgues. It appears harsh to us because we are seemingly far more tolerant of sin than God is. We are far more accepting in Christianity today of sin than God is. Let me illustrate. My wife came home the other day. She told me of a pregnant teen at Tyrone. And when she was confronted, she said, my church did not say anything about the fact as a teenager that I'm pregnant. They accepted me. And I can just ask God to forgive me and everything will be okay in my life. Is that true? The point of this illustration is not to shame the young girl, but the point is to shame on us that we have come to the point in our country that we overlook sin. We minimize it, and we minimize its effects upon ourselves and one another within the church. We excuse it. Uncle Sally's drinking habit's not so bad. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, how many times do Christians do this?
we think we can sin first and ask feign forgiveness and we look away from the sin of others and attempt to deceive ourselves as if we are mature Christians because we tolerate it in our midst. Romans 6, 1 says, Thou fool, shall we continue in sin so that grace may abound? God forbid that we even think that way. We must never tolerate sin under the banner of love. The point of the story and of my illustration is don't tempt God. They tempted, they tested God, and they failed miserably. Don't put him to the test to see how much you can get away with before the hammer comes down upon your life. They put the spirit of the Lord to the test, it says in 5.9. They tested him to see how far he would go in his tolerance of their hypocrisy. Well, it was not very far, was it? We ought to fear God and shun to do evil. Moses, in the book of Deuteronomy, repeatedly commands the people to put away evil in the midst of thee. Better root it out. Peter's role, as is ours, was only to confront it for purity's sake. It was not his to judge. The judgment came from God. And it was severe. We all too often are told to stay out of the meddling in my affairs. It's my life. Stay out of it. Or we are held at arm's length that we are not to judge one another. We throw that card out. like <laughs> it's, it's kind of like it's get out of free jail car in Monopoly. I got this. You know, and they have a whole pocket full of them. We need to become intolerant of those that wave this flag in our face. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. We are brothers and sisters in Christ with one another. We are members one of another. And when we sin, we don't sin in a vacuum. And to ignore the sin is equally as evil as doing the sin itself. So why is hypocrisy so deadly? Why is it deadly? Why is pretending to be something you are not to others so disastrous to one's life and the life of a church? Well, there's... There's many. I, I have five if you got the notes in the back there. Uh, and I believe the first one is the worst one. And it is the one which all the other reasons spawn off of. And that is pretending breeds pretenders. Pretending breeds pretenders. Because judgment is not dispensed by God immediately all the time. Like in the case of Ananias and Sapphira, we learn to deceive and play the game. Then others learn the same behavior, and the church becomes nothing more than a Sunday demonstration of feigned religiosity. And my, I, I, mean, I hope it's not true of this church. Only you can answer that. But I've been in other churches, and it's, it seems like, Did I come to church today or did I come to a show? I led 50 people to the Lord this week. And look around, there's 25 people in the church. Our children and our friends learn to pretend they are right with God and say the right, if they say the right things, 
dressed the right way, weighed the offering envelope before they placed it into the offering plate. You ever see people do that? Ten cents. We laugh about it. And we kind of look at ourselves when we do it and say, Oop. I shouldn't have done that. We train hypocrites, a show for people to applaud and not to do and say things that are right in the sight of God because they fear God and they want his approval, whether someone notices or not. That's where we need to get in our lives, right? It doesn't matter where I'm at whether I'm struggling or whether things are okay with my God and I right now. I'm not going to put up a false mask to show my weaknesses. And I'm not going to put up a false mask that I'm some great Christian either. Because a great Christian would never do that. The problem is that pretending breeds pretenders. It contaminates our assemblies. It contaminates our households. Honestly, others who really know you, the real you, and when our profession does not match our practice, others catch on and they begin to know that it is all a show and they learn and they follow the example and we all become professional Christian play actors in some great drama called life. Jesus said in Luke chapter 12, verse 1, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. They were the kings of hypocrisy. You know, people within the church see it, but so do the people without, right? The lost also see it. They see through the hypocrisy and they say, if that is what Christianity is all about, then they don't want anything to do with coming to church. And if you are a hypocrite and tell them the truth, it is easily dismissed because you're not genuine and truthful, which leads to the second reason. Pretending wipes out trust. Pretending wipes out trust. Getting back to our opening illustration, we've become accustomed to our politicians lying to us, to putting up a false front, to appear to be conservative or righteous when they are not. How much do you trust the men and women in Washington because they lie to you repeatedly on both sides of the aisle? Do you trust them? And you shouldn't. Every election should be a referendum on them until they start telling the truth and being honest with us. Well, you know, hypocrisy among us is no different. When we're hypocritical, others see it and it breaks down the trust. Remember, this is a trust. We've committed our lives to you. You've committed our, your lives to us. This is a trust. Just like our marriage is a trust. What does lying in a marriage do to a relationship? It kills it. It kills it. She can better handle me being rotten and all the things that I am sometimes better than she can have me putting up a false mask and deceiving her and lying to her about things, right? Where were you? What were you doing? Right? Right? 
Hypocrisy and being exposed to it kills relationships. It weakens our brothers and sisters in Christ, in the body of Christ. We pretend to be religious or righteous to others, but it's a lie at times. Duplicity is meant to trick others into thinking better of you than you really are. It is lying to one another. And there is nothing that kills trust more than when we can't trust the words and actions of another. Is this the real you? Was the real you that came here Sunday morning? And the real you that's going to leave? Or are you playing a game? Barnabas' actions and giving are transparent. He was encouraging. He was faithful to others in the church. And others trusted him. And they benefited from his faithfulness and his comfort that he brought them. Hypocrisy breaks trust within the church and among its members, but it also breaks trust with those outside. If our life is play acting and we get exposed, it places a stumbling block to the loss. What they were thinking, Christians are really no different than anyone else. If they are phonies, then Christianity must not be true. Right? Put yourself in their shoes. I was lost for 24 years. And I used to go to, I'll tell you, it was, it was horrible. <laughs> I mean, I was only 10 years old. I used to go to that church, that Lutheran church, and he used to preach the message. And there was a lady in the front, I'm telling you. She was a piece of work. She used to, oh, amen, Pat. And she hung on every one of his words, and she, you know, she was so vocal. Oh, that's so wonderful. And she used to praise Matt. And everyone in the church knew, everybody in the church knew that her life was a sham. Yet she played it every Sunday morning. And I sat there, a lost 10-year-old. And even if the gospel was preached in there, I didn't hear a word of it. Because if that's what Christianity is, guess what? I don't want any part of it. Right? And do you blame them? Do you blame their rationale? You would say the same thing, right? For us, we really need transparency to build trust. This is not to say uh, that others need to know everything that's going on in your heart and mind. I, you don't need to know everything that's going on in my heart and mind, and neither do I need yours either, okay? That's too much for us all to bear, <laughs> right? But they need to see the real you, and you need to be the real you in front of them. And I need to be the real me in and, 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 and front of you. For example, take, take, take a simple question. How are you doing today? How are you doing today? You may answer rotten, which is honest. And then you'll tell me why you're rotten. And then you'll proceed to tell you, uh, tell the person every ache and pain that you have <laughs> and you're experiencing that day, that's an example of telling too much. But at least you're honest, right? On the flip side, you can answer, okay. My son, Ben, okay. How was school like? Okay. How was the last four months of college? Okay. when in fact there are real issues in your life. My heart's really not okay. And a person finds out later that you, uh, you weren't forthcoming. You really weren't okay. You really did have struggles in your life. What does that do to the trust? 
when someone generally asks you, how are you doing today? Are you okay, brother, sister? If we are all truthful about our triumphs as well as our failings, we can be open and honest and through love and the ministry of the t- truth and submission to it, we can, by the power of God, meet the challenges that each of us face in life. When we are truthful, with no masks to hide behind, then we can accurately assess our needs, our strengths, and our weaknesses, and the strengths, weaknesses, and the needs of others. I, I hope you grasp that truth for your life. That's what church life is about, okay? This may be a secret to you, but none of us has arrived. None of us has to prop ourselves up to be the Apostle Paul, right? Because none of us are. This is a group, as Chris was saying, this is a group that is bound together by great weaknesses, but yet a very powerful God who is there to help us grow in our weaknesses. And when we have strengths, we are to use those strengths for one another. So when the eye tries to see for you, Don't say, I don't look for me. I don't want to see. Our foot wants to walk or kick. Our fingers want to scratch an itch that's on your back. Don't deny it. Accept it. A body built on a level of trust can have a tremendous impact corporately, but also externally on the community in the world of Christ. Number three, this duplicity destroys unity. We prop ourselves up to be something we are not, and in putting up these false fronts, we destroy the unity in the fellowship of believers. The church, this church, can only have success and grow when the people of God live in total trust of one another, where there is unity of trust, oneness of heart and mind. Then will the church flourish in the power of the spirit where there is duplicity and distrust it is bound to crumble and fracture and its witness and light will cease with the situation in this couple we can clearly see that God is greatly concerned about the integrity and the unity of our fellowship Do you share his same concerns? Number four, pretending prevents us from seeing our own true spiritual needs. It was bad enough they were lying to others, but in a sense they were lying to themselves, right? And when we play the role of a hypocrite, We block. We block ourselves from seeing our true spiritual needs. First of all, then I am a hypocrite, (laughs) right? That I am lying. That I am embezzling. That I am stealing. It blocks us from seeing our lostness and or our need for real spiritual change. We live a lie. We convince ourselves that all is well. We pray the prayer. We walked an aisle at camp when we were young, but we've deceived ourselves. And we're so good at it. I mean, that we deceived ourselves as well. We deceive others, but we're so good at it, we deceive ourselves as well to our own spiritual needs. That's a tragedy, isn't it? Hypocrisy will do that. 
Finally, pretending prevents us from meeting the spiritual needs of others. When we play the Christian game of hypocrisy, we are always looking out for our own self-interests and not the interests of others around us. We are looking, we, we are loving self more than we are loving God and loving others, and thusly their needs are unintended by us. Self-love hinders by having all our love focus inward and not outward. We are preventing ourselves from growing spiritually, and in doing so, we are blinded from helping meet the needs of others in this self-absorption. We spend all of our time exalting ourselves and making others think we are something that we are not, and in the process, the needs of others go unmet. It has been said the greatest persecution for the church, the deadliest game in which we are involved in, involve ourselves in, It is not the persecution from without. But rather it is the persecution that comes from within. These men will quite handle the persecution in chapter, uh, in chapter 3 from those outside. It will ramp up at the end of chapter 5 here. And when we get to chapter 7, they're literally killing them. When we get to chapter 8, Paul is killing them all. Not just one, Stephen. He's killing them all. Lock them in prison and killing them. You know what? The church handled that. And the church has handled that all the way through history, right? What's the worst thing they could do to me? Kill me. At least I know it. <laughs> they can handle that. But there's a worse poison. And that's why the hypocrisy is so deadly. Because the persecution from within is far greater. It has been far greater a problem for the church in these last 2,000 years than the persecution from without. Lying, deceit, pretending will kill a church fa way faster than any government takeovers or any persecution from the world. Are you playing the game of hypocrisy? It is a game you will ultimately lose, and so will others around you. Nobody likes a hypocrite, and nor should they. Is there a cure? Is there a cure? Well, there's no cure, really. <laughs> but there is a big help. Look at verse 11. Look at verse 11. And great fear came upon all the church and upon as many as heard these things. The answer to hypocrisy is to fear God. Honest and true living with an awe and fear of God is what is required. Fear of what he sees, fear of what he thinks, reverence and soberness will keep us on guard against the deadly leaven of hypocrisy. If, you la if your life lacks integrity, turn to God. Beg him to make the changes necessary in your life before it is too late. When I was preparing for this message, I thought about how many times I've been a hypocrite. How many times I was more concerned with what other people thought than what God knows. And you know what? It's shocking. It's scary. You would think, you know, where I'm at in my life, that I wouldn't have to try to prop myself up to be something I'm not, you know? I mean, I'm 
reached as far as I'm going to reach. But I find myself still doing little things. Little silly little things to play the game. How about you? Have you ever tried to impress the pastor or another member about the level of your spirituality or commitment? Little ways, deadly ways. The pastor had been preaching on the importance of daily Bible reading. He and his wife were invited over to the parishioner's home for dinner. His wife saw a note on the kitchen calendar, pastor slash missus for dinner slash dust all Bibles. Nobody likes a hypocrite. Especially God. Nobody likes a a hypocrite. How about you when you reflect about you? Do you hate it in you? It's a deadly sin. Deadly sin. Someday you may ask and Ananias and Sapphira just how deadly it was. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Lord, help us not to be hypocrites. Lord, we, I mean, we had an invitation. We'd all come down. We all could say, yeah, I'm, I'm a hypocrite at times. Lord, the lesson from this is that we ought to learn to fear you. Fear the deadliness of sin and especially the sin of hypocrisy. And begin to fear and love you and to shun evil in our own life and the life of those in this midst. Lord, we sweep way too much under the rug. Forgive us for that. You don't sweep anything under the rug. Help us to be like you. Lord, if there be one here today that frankly is living a lie, whether they think they're saving or not because there's no spiritual life there, Right? They'd be honest with you, Lord, and ask you to forgive them of their sin. And they would turn to you and seek your face and ask you to work in their lives again so that when they heard the word of God, they would respond to it by faith, faith and salvation. Lord, for Christians who are more concerned with impressing others than being open and honest with their Struggles in their life. Lord, their struggles will continue to be unmet unless if they take off the mask and turn to you. So, Lord, I pray you'd work there. Lord, we thank you for this word. This is a shocking story in Acts. Lord, help us not to forget it. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's sing one more hymn. Tim's going to come forth. We'll sing one last hymn. <coughs> we'll sing the first and the last verse. Please stand. 276.